What impact do the midterm elections have on cryptocurrencies, the economy, and your investments? We're here to break down these topics with our next guest, Jeffrey Tucker. He is the founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. He is a former editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research. He is an expert on technology and the crypto sectors, having written about the subject for many, many years. And of course, he's the author of several books, including Bit by Bit, and his latest book, The Market Loves You, Why You Should Love It Back. Jeffrey, it's an honor to have you on Kitco. Welcome to the show. It's nice to see you. Thanks so much for having me. Let's break down what's going on with midterms first and before we move on to some of the other topics, including the Federal Reserve and investments. As we speak, the Republicans have the majority in both the House and the Senate. Only a slightly, though. We're not seeing a red wave, as some people have speculated we would see. Why no red wave this time? I think there's a lack of clarity in messaging and and candidate quality. Those are the those two things together. Uh, you know, it's not enough. You can't just go out there. As we learned from Florida, to, the successes. You just can't go out there and say your life's terrible, inflation's awful, uh, interest rates are rising, the economy's collapsing. Vote for me. You know, <laughs> you've got to have a, a, a clarity about why these things are happening and what needs to be done about it. And that's where I think the Republicans completely failed. And I would fa in fact argue they deliberately failed because they have been part of the problem. So that's. That's the issue. And so it conveyed an impression that uh, all these candidates are just lying to voters. They don't trust any of them. So uh, that's why the red red wave didn't materialize. I mean, a lot of the primaries were the primary candidates were selected based on who among them agreed that you know Trump got the election stolen from from him in 2020. That's not the basis of a campaign. You know, <laughs> that's not that's not why voters uh, vote just to say, hey, we won the game. The referees were bad. OK, well, all right, maybe. But uh, that's not exactly a, a path towards fixing up the, the the problems. And what we need in this country is a, a drastic change. So I, th I think the the lesson coming out of Florida and Texas and Georgia and South Dakota and Oklahoma was that we need uh, 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 political leaders that are able to connect people's existing economic sufferings with political failures of the past. And that's that was missing all over the country. It was present in the governor's races in those states I mentioned, but largely missing otherwise. And the reason for that is, of course, all the problems began under Republicans. So that's the great taboo topic. A Republican-controlled Congress, would that create gridlocks for fiscal policies? Um, yeah, uh, you know, by the way, the betting odds are still favoring a Democrat control of the Senate. So I don't know why okay. that is. But, so we're, we're going to have to wait and see what that looks like. But um, I just don't think that the Republicans have the backbone to do the kind of cuts that uh, Elon Musk did at Twitter. And that's sort of what we need in government right now. We need to get rid of the administrative bureaucracy. There are 435 agencies, probably just a handful of those we need. So they all need to be cut. And uh, there are 4.3 million uh, permanent civil service employees that uh, those need to be cut. And, and yeah, basically, you need a Congress to do to the administrative state what uh, Elon Musk did to Twitter. Uh, but because they face no economic necessity to do that, it's going to take real bravery. And they just don't, they don't seem to have that, unfortunately. Well, there's cutbacks on personnel, which, you, which, you, which is what you talked about. But what about cutback on spending and taxes, yeah, right? Jeffrey? Yeah, well, there's no payoff to politicians for cutting spending. So, you know, I, I just don't know. I mean, they always promise a good game, and I've seen this again and again. But I, I would have to wait and see. Now, of course, none of these budgets that they pass will be signed by Biden. And then that leads to, you know, the great budget standoff and the the, the budget, uh, then the government shutdowns once it's not passed and the debt increases are not approved. And then the Republicans, then it becomes a war of words. So I'm afraid we're looking at uh, that to at least two more years of gridlock. I don't know how much worse it has to get in this country before uh, the Republican Party wakes up and starts giving a clear message and before the American people realize that we desperately need change. I think part of the problem is that people are just demoralized right now. You know, I mean, there was a great optimism going into Tuesday. It didn't uh, materialize for the reasons I think I, I mentioned. Uh, but, you know, what that does is it causes people to just kind of give up. And that's exactly, in a sense, what, I guess, for lack of a better term, they want you to do. They want you to give up and be demoralized. Um, but right now, you know, we're in a very strange situation in this country where we've got an elite class of rulers at all levels, public sector, private sector, nonprofits, 
that are really lording it over the rest of us and you know, driving the economy into the ground. And it's it's killing uh, living standards in America. I mean, we, we're seeing continual declines in real income. And uh, people are digging into their, throwing their credit cards around wildly. I mean, the credit card debt is ballooning, even though credit card uh, interest rates are running 17%. Before it's, before Powell's done, they're going to be 25%. So people are going to be stuck with these very high debts. That's a, that's a looming problem. You can't just forgive that debt, or maybe you can. But I'm, so I'm just not seeing a lot of hope out there uh, in the economic realm. Um, I'm pretty sure Powell, now this has been a little bit of a surprise. When he started increasing the federal funds rate, I thought it was just purely cosmetic, that it wasn't really going to happen, that uh, the Fed was pretty dedicated to avoiding recession, um, you know, at all costs, as they have been for the better part of 40 years. But I think that I was wrong about that. I think Powell is serious about this. He's been convinced, and I think probably rightly, that we need to get real, uh, we need to get interest rates in, in a positive territory in real terms, which is to say, He's got to get the federal funds rate above the inflation rate, which, depending on how you measure it, I think the Fed prefers the PCE ratio, which is a personal consumption expenditure, which is running about 6%, 40-year high. Right now, interest rates are uh, approaching, what, 4%, something like that. So we've got at least two or three more 75% basis uh, points of, of uh, upward movement, which will get us to the, the spring and summer. But, but it may have to be higher than that. And also, that depends on the idea that the recurrent rate of inflation stabilizes rather than gets worse, which we don't have any assurances of that either. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm pretty sure Powell's dedicated to um, uh, to this current mission. Like He believes he's not going to get inflation under control until he can obtain positive interest rates, what he calls the terminal rate. Um, and even if that involves... Uh, bringing about you know a really a deep uh, recession. That's they're they're pretty committed to this. Uh, Powell seems like a very angry man right now. A <laughs> very angry man. Well, let's talk about Powell and uh, an inflation data that, that just came in this morning, Jeffrey. Uh, huge gains in the stock markets as we speak. The S&P 500 is up 4% from markets yep. open. That's a huge number. Uh, and largely because of inflation data having fallen a little bit, headline CPI came in at 7.7%. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one could argue that this is the beginning of the end of high inflation. Would you agree with that statement? I don't. I don't think we're anywhere near that. I don't think the okay. uh, six point three trillion dollars that was unleashed over the last thirty months is anywhere endemic in the economy. Uh, we're nowhere near done with it. And I'm sorry, the uh, seven point seven is just nothing to write home about. Uh, the other thing is that you know, don't forget that you know the month to month increases in July were zero, and that made Biden really happy. And then that trend reversed. So uh, month over month, we're at the same place we were last month. No change, which is zero point four. So the year-over-year -year averages are just being dragged down by a summer slowdown, but I don't mm -hmm. think it really represents anything substantial. Why the stock markets are moving? Well, you know, um, you know, it's a, a little bit like if you've ever played the slots at Vegas, what happens is you put in $100 and it goes down to 90, it goes down to 80, it goes down to 70, then it goes up ten dollars and you start getting optimistic. So you still feed your money in. <laughs> I'm afraid that's where we are with the stock markets right now. It's been down, 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 up, up, down, 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 up, up. And um, I, I think there's some sense of relief that the elections are over and 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 people with no nowhere else to put their money right now are, are throwing it into to stocks. We'll see how long that lasts. I mean, it could correct downwards and and really not amount to to much. But I mean, investors don't have any real choice at this point. The only I would say. Yeah, I think th this is a good time to be in real, real stuff. You know, like re like real estate. Uh, that seems really? to be. Uh, Let's talk about that. Well, yeah, and, yeah. and not not commercial or residential real estate, but but just it's just straight up land. I mean, that seems like you know the, the one of the best deals going out there right now, and that's where all the uh, the big bucks are are headed. Uh, okay. but the business conditions seem too weak right now, and. You know, I, 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 there's somebody else too. You're seeing seeing within financials a dramatic shift away 
from all the high performers during the lockdown pandemic period are now being creamed. And the stuff that's really booming is, you know, the, the, the commodities, the retail sector and hospitality and traditional, you know, kind of re real work sort of stuff. I mean, that's where the action is in the economy right now. That's where the job, we're seeing huge shifts in the labor market. Um, and and the, the you know the, the the unemployment rates really disguise this, but you're seeing a real sort of euthanasia of the of the overclass within these large large the tech companies that got so bloated over 14 years of zero percent interest rates uh, that are not able to sustain that under high inflationary conditions with uh, uh, very low liquidity in the market. So they're you know you're seeing these huge cuts taking place at you know Twitter and Facebook and Amazon and Google. And it's just begun, you know, it's really going to be something. So we've got a lot, of, and all these people are hitting the job market at the same time. So where are the job uh, opportunities out there? Well, they're in, you know, real work that requires nine to five, like working with your hands sort of stuff and hospitality and, and otherwise. So a lot of these workers are going to be very disappointed to discover that their, their PJ weed soaked life of the last uh, 24 months is, is not sustainable. So, so you're absolutely right. The, the unemployment numbers, as you said, disguise what's really going on in the economy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps there's just a bit of a lag in the reporting, as you you know, an unemployment no, last month. No, it really data. the the U three numbers are really pretty much useless, uh, and okay. we discovered because they only measure people who are on the job market. And in times of labor shortages, those are going to be very very low. But if you want to look at what's really going on, you know, check out labor participation rates and worker population ratios. That's where you see that we're nowhere near pre-pandemic levels. And if you want to run a regression from the rate of increase that was that was in place in 2019, we're probably missing 8.3 million people from the workforce through women that dropped out to take care of their kids because the daycares were closed and the schools were closed and they just having to come back. Early retirements have taken place. Uh, a lot of people have just moved home and and forgotten about jobs. It's 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 a, it's a work ethic problem. But 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 just people are just not returned to work yet after the disaster of 2020. I'm not saying this is the case, but uh, a lower labor force participation rate may indicate actually a strong economy. Well, not, not, not an economy per se, but like you said, early retirements. Perhaps people just made so much money over the pandemic that uh, they need to, they don't need to work anymore dropped out of the labor market. Yeah, that's right. But you know, labor markets are just, they're just not looking healthy. Now, mm -hmm. uh, one side of that is, and maybe that's what you're pointing to, is that in this economy, the people who have skills and are willing to work hard and really uh, able to show up on time and, and, and make a contribution are going to be doing just fine. Right. I mean, those those people are doing just fine. So, uh, which I hope that includes your listeners. So they're going to be OK. Uh, but the, the problems are going to ex exist in, in the among those class of people that thought they could earn six figures by by just tricking their mouse by their, their boss by buying mouse jigglers from Amazon and <laughs> light, lighting up the slack, lighting up the slack button that says I'm busy. That's not going to work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Companies have started cracking down on that, by the way. Let's not advertise this any further in case people are actually using it and they don't want their bosses to find out, Jeffrey. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But you're, you're absolutely right. Unemployment is trickling up. People have, economists have told me that, hey, prior recessions have usually started with low unemployment and then it ramps up, right? The Fed's looking at this data as well. They're probably thinking unemployment is probably going to trickle up depending on whatever stat you look at, at the same time, inflation has been trickling down. 7.7 .7 is still high, but it's been coming down steadily since the peak of 9.1 since June. So you got two competing forces, lower unemployment, uh, sorry, lower inflation, higher unemployment. What are they going to do? Those are the two mandates of the Fed. Uh, so it's also important to remember that a lot of businesses have been facing profitability squeezes over the last uh, yes. 18 months that they have forestalled doing anything about. You know, they've invested a lot of capital uh, for a long time because they didn't want to pass on the, the cost to consumers. They don't know where that, you know, that magic point is where uh, their high prices actually reduce uh, demand to the point that they, you know, start hitting revenue. Um, but we're really probably reaching the end of that point. And then when that arrives, you've got real problems. Actually, you're already starting to see this. So you're starting to cut, sorry, see dramatic cost reduction, uh, starting with the labor force. But if that doesn't work, you know, what happens next, especially when uh, you're starting to see real, uh, you're starting to see, you know, dramatic, not real wages increases, but, but real, what's called, you know, wa uh, uh, wage, uh, 
uh, push wage push inflation you know, is taking place. So you get more, you know, r- rising wages at a lower real wages, but rising in, in uh, nominal terms, and then that goes out and you know it, it, it turns into hot money on the street, which only feeds more inflationary expectations. And then you've got the cost pool uh, factor happening with businesses. So you've got an end. Uh, uh, really embeddedness to this inflation right now. So I'm not too optimistic that we're going to continue to see this this softening trend. The other thing we need to remember is that you know the Fed's target rate of inflation is two percent, but that, that we're never going back to 2019 prices. And this is this is the uh, the tragedy of the whole thing. I mean, for a long time, people thought, oh, but well, this is just a temporary glitch. You know, we're going to go back to normal in no time. Well, that's that's just not going to happen. I mean, we are. Right now, where we we're going to be for, for forever. I was running some numbers this morning. I'm just kind of taking a broad look at this. Since 1980, if you wanted to have a, a dollar in 1980, you did nothing but hold on to it. It's now worth 25 cents. So you know, over the 40 year period, we've seen a you know a devastating uh, devaluation take place in dollars, and a lot of that has happened over the last uh, uh, two years. So okay. uh, there's not going to be any going back. Uh, like I, and plus, I really don't see this inflation going uh, going away or getting anywhere near that two percent target uh, anytime in the next twelve months. The dollar is obviously weaker in domestic currency terms, like you mentioned, because of inflation. But it's actually right. relatively strong against other currencies. The DXY has been on a tear all year. What's going right. on there? Well, you know, I'm glad you brought this up because I have seen more confusion about this topic than any other. And maybe this is normal because financial journalists are saying, well, the dollar's strong. Yeah. Uh, and then right beneath it is like, oh, there's uh, the dollar's weak. Well, which is it? Right? <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate that that people get very confused. I guess it depends it. if you travel a lot or not. But yes, go on. Well, but even then, you know, what's interesting is it, it means that the dollar is strong relative to other currencies. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that, uh, the, you know, let's just take the, something like the, the euro or some other obscure, you know, the pound or whatever. Uh, still, uh, traveling to London today as versus five years ago is going to be vastly more expensive because the dollar is weaker in terms of all goods and services all over the world. It's just that the exchange rate between the dollar and these other currencies makes the dollar look relatively strong. So you're going to have a, 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 a more powerful spending experience in London today than you did today than you would have three years ago if you're using dollars. Uh, rather rather than using pounds. So that's the way it works. I mean, that's how you can have a strong dollar that's actually being devalued all the time. So I, th- I think that this is just too many steps of thinking for most people. That's why they get confused about it. Okay, interesting. And uh, over the course of the medium to long term, what is your outlook for the US dollar? I've heard all sorts of arguments from both sides of the debate. One on the extreme, on one extreme is that the dollar will completely collapse. You know, yeah. if you take a look at fiat currencies, most of them throughout history have collapsed. The Roman Empire yeah. has collapsed. Uh, well, I don't know what that means, practically speaking, the collapse of the dollar, but perhaps you can yeah. elaborate on that. I don't, on the other I don't hand, think, okay, yeah. Please, I don't think we're anywhere system. anywhere near that. Um, uh, you know, I think we're going to continue to see these long, slow declines of the value of, of the purchasing power yeah. of the dollar. Now, in terms of its status as an international reserve currency, wow, that has been shored up over the last uh, uh, two years, really, and in ways that I didn't expect. You know, yeah, more than sixty percent of global trade is still conducted with the still, USD. Generally. And and it's, I haven't looked at that recently, but it's most likely uh, probably rising. And that's just simply because, as bad as our central bank is, it's been able to get away with a lot more uh, quantitative easing than any other uh, central bank in the world. Precisely because the U.S. has the advantage of being the world reserve currency. And I I assume that we've got a lot more years built into that. That's going to continue to be uh, true, even if the dollar continues to lose purchasing power in terms of goods and services domestically and really all over the world. So you just don't notice it as much because our competition is sucks even more than we do, basically. (laughs) Okay, so we're the, uh, as the saying goes, we're the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry basket. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> yep, that's uh, that's quotes been circulating. Let's talk about your earlier uh, quote about buying real stuff. I want to talk about different assets now, going starting from real estate and also cryptos and finally stocks. Buying real stuff, real estate. A lot of people are concerned about real estate. I'm talking about residential real estate. You were talking right. about land. Um, right. Let's let's differentiate between the two here. Yeah, uh, because uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, uh, residential real estate right now is is a is a market that's completely frozen. You know, it's hard to draw these curves any steeper than they are right now. And I'm not just talking about Federal Reserve statistics, but industry statistics. I mean, basically, you call it a buyer's market if there were any buyers. You know, it's it's really been an incredible disaster. I mean, and and think how quickly this happened. It was only about 14 months ago. When you whispered to your neighbor, you were thinking about selling your house, you had 10 people lined up at your front door ready to buy, outbidding each other, right? And that was 14 months ago. And now, you know, those same people just finally got around to patching the holes in the wall and vacuuming the carpets and putting it on the market. And now there's no takers, right? So the whole market's been frozen by the Fed's uh, uh, federal funds policy, which has just driven up uh, mortgage rates to seven percent, I expect them to go to, to 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 ten and higher. You know, and so there's there's absolutely no hope right now in uh, residential real estate. Commercial real estate depends on where you are. It's all about location. I mean, offices right higher. now. I, 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 yeah, I don't yeah. mean to interrupt, up, but I, I got a just just first thought that came to my mind. General statement: Can people afford rates at ten and higher? Jeffrey? Well, they can't afford them. They can't afford them at ten, at uh, seven, right? So, but you know, so but that's where they're headed. That's what's going to happen under under Powell's policy. We've got at least got three more seventy five percent basis points of increase in the federal fund rate, and those filter through the yield curve to hit uh, mortgages, and that's that's where that's where we're headed. Now, I you know what's interesting about this is that it's going to look very different from two thousand eight. Right, we we learned what it meant to have uh, 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 carrying a mortgage and have a house underwater at the time. What that meant was that if you put it on the market and then rebought the house yourself, you'd be way better off than you are just doing nothing. Right? I mean, because because the uh, uh, the, the, the the it was much more. Ex you were holding a mortgage that was much more worth much more than the house could sell for. Now uh, today. Uh, but that that weird situation in 2008 happened only because uh, uh, interest rates were so very, very low. And that's when everybody's refinancing their homes and trying to take advantage of the cheap credit. That's no longer true. So, you know, offloading your house now you know, would, would embroil you into a, a mortgage situation that's very likely worse than what you have right now. You bought your house at uh, 2%. And and now you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna rebuy it at at seven or going on eight percent nine percent no that's not gonna work financially because these interest rates are highly affect your your monthly payments so we're not gonna see houses underwater like we saw in two thousand eight it's gonna be a very different thing which is just gonna be people will be trapped in their homes and and uh, grateful that they locked in uh, the rates they did when they did. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I've heard from a you know, personal anecdote, uh, banks have not yet called their clients up uh, to refinance their trigger rates. They haven't gone uh, to that level yet, uh, but they will, is what people have said to me. Yeah, I don't I don't know. You know, uh, I was listening to Peter Schiff the other day. He seems to know a lot more about these uh, mortgage markets than I do. But uh, I, 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 there are people out there with these trigger rates, these flexible rates, and uh, they're going to be hit very hard. Now, the the credit card interesting uh, problem is very interesting, too, because you've seen, as you saw from the latest data, people keep ramping up their credit cards to try to you know maintain their lifestyles in the, in the presence of real falling incomes yeah. and relying on that plastic. Um, but but credit card interest rates are hitting 17 percent. They're going to grow and grow. So, yeah. you know, yeah. that's going to amount to a serious financial squeeze for for a lot of uh, people that have been, you know, not used to paying off their balances every month. They're, they're, they're taken in by these revolving rates that at, at, at some point was pretty affordable. They got into very bad financial habits and that's going to be good torturing them over the over the coming uh, 12 months so you're uh, so it, it, is it just 12 months perhaps uh, it, perhaps longer jeffrey you're describing a systemic issue with yeah. a cutback in spending i mean it's going to take a lot longer than perhaps 12 months to cut back or pay down these credit card debts right that's right uh, we might be in one, uh, first year of four if you want to use the 40 years ago example of, of 70 uh, 78 to, to 82 and 83 
right? I mean, that was the last time that we we uh, we did a Volcker, you know, to the inflation rate and used you know high interest rates to crush uh, embedded inflation. It worked, but it also caused immense. Uh, pain over a very long period of time. Four years would be a good example of that. But if you go further back in time, you know, uh, the the Great Depression, which every financial crisis looks different, by the way, you can't, you can learn from the historical experiences, but not expect them to be repeated exactly. But that, what began in 1929 really did last till about 1948. So, uh, and that included a a ghastly war. So, you know, I mean, There's there I if, if we can get out of the present situation with you know a, a solid four years of 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 very low growth or or negative uh, growth without a financial crisis at this point I think we would be very lucky so far we've avoided that financial crisis so if that starts happening and there are a number of triggers that could cause that then um, it could be a real mess and and. You know, one of the things I've learned over the last uh, 31 months is, you know, you should be prepared to expect something that's far worse than you ever imagined. I mean, that that is the lesson I think of the that we've learned over the last 31 months. I think I, I have some other questions, but I will be irresponsible as a journalist to not follow up on that statement. Uh, what is that, what are you talking about, Jeffrey? What's going to be far worse that we haven't experienced yet? Well, we didn't expect, and I got to tell you, that my entire life of researching and writing and, you know, all these kind of books and everything, we we never would have expected that markets could have been so severely broken as they were uh, in 2020. We just didn't really believe that it would be possible that supply chains all over the world, all supply chains all over the world would be shattered, that we'd mm. be decoupling from from the main source of trade relationships that have been had been a main source for growth for the last uh, several decades. That's been been shattered. We've got uh, the world broken up into all these trade zones. These uh, sanctions against Russia uh, taking place. You know, cutting off energy supplies to to the U.S. and to to Europe at the same time. You've got political elites dreaming of a zero carbon world so the president just let slip a couple of days ago that there'll be no more drilling i mean you know this is a world i never thought i would inhabit so there's there's a lot of crazy people out there willing to do a lot of very dangerous things i mean just think about the joker and put him in a coat and tie and give him power right that's what that's what we're looking at here so you're it sounds like you're implying that there's going to be more social unrest right is that uh, the Joker? Well, That's the first we, image I have in my head. Yeah. Well, we never expected uh, our cities to look the way they do uh, today. We never expected that New York would uh, introduce vast segregation and and uh, you know deliberately set out to bankrupt Broadway. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of malevolent forces uh, at work in the world. And also, we didn't expect that the Fed would acquiesce. To uh, you know, ten trillion dollars in congressional spending just overnight because because of a pandemic. You know, I mean, th- there's been a lot of very strange things happening, a lot of breakages we never expected uh, to to happen have happened. So uh, we've never really been here before. The other thing that I do think is extremely interesting, despite what it looked like on on the uneventful in the end uh, Tuesday, there's a lot of discontent in this country, a lot of political uh, discontent, Uh, not just division, but real loss of trust in the elites. And that is something, my friend, that we have never experienced in a in a modern industrialized democracy, the sort of mass loss of trust. We've seen it in other places and other times under different systems of government. Vietnam, perhaps. Sir? Vietnam, perhaps. Yeah. And and South America again and again. And, you know, you think about 1989 and 1990 in Eastern Europe and the old Soviet Union. We know what that looks like, but we've never seen that Mm -hmm. in uh, in in modern industrialized democracies. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned, I don't know if you're mentioning Vietnam as an example of that. Um, Vietnam and about, War is an example of perhaps people oh, losing yeah. trust in the government. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So I don't know what that looks like in the U.S. context. So the only real safety valve we have in this country is elections. Mm. But we've learned over the last 48 hours that those systems 
are broken too. So I don't know. I've been scrambling around for a wise historian somewhere who can explain to me what we can expect, you know, based on some example from ancient Greece or Rome. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like really. Okay. Um, but but I'm 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 I, I think it's it really is I would say probably time to prepare for the worst. The the times of normalcy have really come to an end. I mean, what we did uh, to our economies over the last 31 months was just beyond uh, belief, and we're going to pay a very heavy price for that. And and we're also not getting really uh, very much honesty from the part of anybody. Actually, what, ironically, uh, I would say that one of the few voices of of forthright truth telling out there right now in public life is of all people Jerome Powell who's responsible for a lot of the problems but uh these days he's he's making a lot more sense Interesting. Well, one can only prognosticate, Jeffrey. That's all one can do, uh, unless you are a time traveler from the future. Uh, looking ahead then, applying this to uh, the financial markets, you brought up 1929. I'm just curious as to how you think the financial markets, stocks, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, uh, will behave in this broken system that you just described. You brought up 1929. Keep in mind the stock markets did not recover to their 19 pre-29 high until the 50s. Is that going to happen right. again? Uh, it very well could, or they could recover, but uh, but not in real terms. If you know what I mean, mm, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like I say, I don't I don't know how much of the markets have absorbed the monetary profligacy over the last thirty months. I just I don't you know. It's hard to say. Is it have we are we have we done ten percent, twenty percent? Are we over the fifty percent mark? I don't know. You know, we don't have zero prevalence studies to. To, to be able to me measure, you know, whether, but the, all that money has to become endemic. And keep in mind, we've been through these kinds of bouts before, like 2008, but all that money was locked away in cold storage. This time, they, they threw it hot on the streets, you know, uh, they dropped it from helicopters. And we just really haven't been here before. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of repressed inflation out there that really needs to express itself in higher prices. And you're also starting to see some dabbling in some forms of price control. I'm sure you saw Biden's, you know, you know, angry denunciation of of airline fees for baggages and restaurants that are adding service fees onto bills and that sort of thing. So if you can't do that, that's a form of price control. Yes. Um, so I wouldn't rule out um, if things start heading in the wrong direction that this administration's government would would toy around the price controls too. So that's that's a real possibility. Like I say, I think we need to be prepared to expect the unexpected. You know, we've got a lot of rulers that are in love with their power right now and right. and really excited about uh, exercising it. Now, let's talk uh, briefly about crypto, if we may. Yes, of um, course, yes. So, you know, uh, I've been in the space for a very long time, and there's there's been a kind of doctrine, you know, that has been alive for a long, very long time, which is that it's a very good technology, it's better than public money, it's better than national money, it performs much better, it's more secure, it's, you can't censor it, it's, you know, fast and cheap, and, you know, all these claims, and therefore, and this is where the problems come in, the price is going to rise forever because there's a limited quantity of it. Okay, that's not a bad prediction, but it's not by any means baked into the cards, nor is timing necessarily part of that. So what happened over the last uh, three years or so, or you might even go back further in time, is that people, many people in the crypto space confused higher prices with an affirmation of their predictions that it's headed to the moon, that we're going to a million dollars. What was actually happening is that crypto was partaking in a general financial bubble that was taking place as institutions got into it and started believing uh, uh, that it was a, a valuable asset and uh, and started basically moving with, with, with the financial markets. And that, I, mean, I can't put a precise date on it, but it, it started happening uh, certainly two years ago or maybe uh, three, three years ago. So I'm not sure the people in the crypto space really understood. So there is a, an impression somehow that there's, you know, that that Bitcoin and its related cryptocurrencies were immaculately conceived, if you, you know, like like holy entities that were somehow exogenous to, you know, all of public life and would move independently from your normal uh, booms and busts in financial markets. That was the idea, and I I think I. 
tacitly accepted that too, that finally here's a way to secede from the whole, from the forces of the world. That that turned out, uh, just to put it bluntly, not to be true. I mean, the, the, that, yeah. that, that Bitcoin and, 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 and Ethereum and all these currencies uh, have been been gradually be, become an endogenous part of the financial system, which is to say that they're going to be moving according to the same forces that are that are moving the S and P five hundred and and the Dow Jones Industrials too, and that's a, a depressing thing to learn, you know. And so, yeah, it may eventually be to the moon. And maybe it's going to be a million dollars. But what time are we talking about? We're we talking about. Uh, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, we don't know. Just because something is a, a beautiful technology and uh, just because something works doesn't necessarily bake into it, you know, a kind of uh, a linear path of unrelenting success. It's funny you bring up the uh, conception of Bitcoin. Uh, nobody knows who Satoshi is exactly. There's all these theories out there. My favorite one is that Satoshi is actually the NSA, but that that's a different conversation. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, people say that to me on podcasts. You know, they're like, oh, "Did you ever actually work for the NSA?" You know, I mean, it's it. I never know what to say about that. You know, I I feel like I know a lot of the guys that were involved in this this whole thing. In fact, I had a guy come into. Uh, and interview me at length about this that was truly trying to get me to admit something about Bitcoin that I I don't know what he thought I knew, but he was after me, he spent me a whole hour grilling me about who I knew yeah. and when and what and so well, on. <laughs> I, I, I interviewed Craig Wright, who claims to be a, a Bitcoin, yeah. uh, Bitcoin's founder. There's a lot of uh, debate around that as well. But going back to your point about wealth preservation, inflation is going to remain high, broken system. We get that, Jeffrey. How can I preserve my wealth? Is Bitcoin the answer besides land? Uh, it's got to be part of the answer, but you know the, the, this tendency, though, that 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 Bitcoiners have developed recently, that every time the price falls, they pretend to celebrate and say, "Oh, now I can buy it more cheaply than ever." Well, I can tell you, a lot of people have gone bankrupt through that little uh, strategy uh, as applied to stocks. Oh, great! Now I have a lot of bargains. I'm going to go bargain hunting. Yeah, okay. Well, you can only, <laughs> yeah, that that works for a while, but you know. Uh, so if you got money to burn, it's probably a good place. Uh, but if you're trying to preserve uh, your wealth right now, uh, it's a lot, a lot trickier. I, most uh, people I know in the industry believe that your best bet is to uh, preserve your current portfolio with a, a you know a risk mitigating mix of of, mm -hmm. of, of, of stocks. But uh, right now, stay away from the big tech companies that have a long way to fall okay. right now. And uh, you know anything that was booming over over two years, that you know out, you know outsized increases, probably a good time to move on from that. Uh, in the in the end, people need uh, food to eat, and and we're going to be you know fossil fuels are going nowhere. These these are the places that are probably uh, your best your best bets right now. And I know a lot of um, we we've seen how you know the big 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 money is is buying a lot of empty land right now okay. uh, on the expectation that uh, that's that's probably about the best way to preserve your wealth. Uh, Bitcoin, you know, I've never I've always been a, a champion of the technology, but 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 I stopped. Uh, making price predictions about that when my price prediction of the very first $1,000, which I think was in 2013, was bang on to the dollar and to the date. And I thought, well, okay, I got that one right. Now I'm going to leave that industry entirely. So. <laughs> <laughs> Quit while you're ahead, Jeffrey. No, no, no. We want That's you right. back. We want you making more of these <laughs> accurate predictions. Don't just leave us with one now. We got we got a follow up. But um, all right. Well, I'm not going to ask you for an exact day or time, but let me just ask you this. The crypto winter that we're seeing right now, what will trigger a recovery from this if it ever Wait. ends? Right. So, uh, right. Um, I per I personally don't believe that this is a good time to, for anybody to to jump in. Okay. I think we've got a, we've got a, a long way to go before this this one fleshes itself out. Um, 
And, you know, I don't think there's any magic way to look at uh, the technicals of the industry and know when exactly that is, but it doesn't seem like a, a very good time. It's, I would say right now, if you're looking to make money, probably a very risky place for, for your money to be because, we, you know, we could be headed, headed back down to 10 or even uh, much lower. I mean, Bitcoin loves nothing better than to shake chumps out of the market. But if we were to recover from this and, uh, you know, again, we don't know exactly when, to your point, what would be that trigger? Is it the end of the Federal Reserve tightening cycle? Is it the, uh, is it a recovery in the economy? Is it uh, perhaps uh, more pro-crypto uh, regulators and senators in uh, office? What, what needs to yeah. happen? Yeah. OK, so that last point you made, I think, is probably the best one that I could okay. because the regulatory war against crypto has been unrelenting for a very long time. I mean, it really began in 2013, but it just keeps tightening and tightening and tightening. I mean, I can't think of any uh, step towards uh, liberalization that's happened uh, over the better part of nine years. It's always gone in the opposite direction. But yeah, changing the regime in Washington towards a more crypto-friendly, more generally business-friendly environment uh, would, I would think, be very bullish for, for all the crypto there's a, there's a perception that the republicans are more crypto friendly is that true yeah i think i think yeah, i think that's true i mean the, you okay. know i would say that's generally true that's not true for all republicans right but there, mm -hmm. there is a sector of republicans that that seems to you and know of course there's democrats it. like gary gensler who are pro crypto in some sense yes uh yeah i guess there are they're out there there's a bigger problem that uh of the administrative state that's out there and that's dominated you know by by old money interest from the from the fiat banking world and they have no interest in seeing crypto start, starting to compete with them i tell you you know once the stable coins got into the business of basically banking uh they sure did make themselves a target so and now you've got this very interesting thing happening you've got central banks of the world all swearing this is true in europe and uk and especially in, in the us swearing that they're going to make their own cryptocurrencies right this this is this is all the rage you know oh we're going to make our own cryptocurrency well you know i, I it, first of all, i think that would be a disaster because you know they're going to use it. It's not going to be a real crypto, right? We're we're talking about we're not talking about a public blockchain. You're know, using a, a Bitcoin style blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. It'll be a private blockchain that's going to be using blockchain style technology to make uh, faster wealth transfers and then tokenize that and then call it a dollar. I think that's the idea. But I'm just not seeing much evidence. These guys have the confidence to, to the competence to pull that off. Also, if that really happens, they're talking about. I actually. I doubt very so it's it's going to happen because it would mean like basically cutting out the entire uh, existing financial banks and non banks from the system and having it administered entirely by the by the U.S. Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. That seems like the least likely uh, thing to, thing to happen, despite the aspirations. Which, as I say, I think a disaster. On, on the other hand, you know. Could it happen way down the line? You know, uh, is it a threat in five or ten years? Yeah, probably. I think you know, all these things are a threat, but I, I don't see it as an imminent one. Okay, fair enough. Well, Jeffrey, I've held you long enough, but I do want to end on a final point. You talked to me offline about the uh, books that the uh, Brownstone, uh, Brownstone Institute uh, is uh, publishing. Tell us yeah. about some of these. Uh, uh, books so, Brownstone, I started really with the, with the crisis of, of March uh, 20, uh, knowing that it felt very much like World War One and the world would never be the same. I think I was right about that. So, we deal with a lot of public health and economics issues. One of my favorite guys that I run is the great David Stockman, who had a smashing piece uh, yesterday on labor markets. It's just beyond belief. But we're also involved in publishing. So, we've published a couple of books so far, but we've got two coming out. One is uh, a, a, a treatise by a, a, a cultural language scholar, a specialist in Catalonian history. It's called uh, The Treason of the Experts, and it's just a very satisfying read, really powerful book. The other one is uh, called Blindsight 2020, which is a, a, a kind of journalistic account of all the people who have been in a position of being dissidents over the last two years, uh, two and a half years, disagreeing with, with the lockdowns and the vaccine mandates and all the controls uh, that have taken place. And it's a really uh, interesting and not very long read. Both those things are coming up probably before the end of the year. All right. Well, Jeffrey, great to have you on the show. Welcome to Kitco. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.